Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 14 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my good friend and co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you here. So uh, this, this one is, is kind of an exciting one for us. We had a chance to, to, to chat with Rabia Chaudhry, who, if you are any of the millions and millions of people listening to the Serial podcast, you know exactly who that is. Rabia is, of course, the person who brought the case of Adnan Sayed uh, to, to the uh, attention of Sarah Koenig, the reporter who hosts the uh, Serial podcast. And that is, of course, uh, something that uh, has captivated many. As as we follow it, we're we're now uh, very near the end of of th- this season of the show. So so I, Pervez and I are both sort of on tenter hooks right now, wondering uh, what's what's going to happen. That's right. Know? And we thought this would be a great uh, uh, a little side conversation to fill the void that this week uh, with an episode of or a new episode of Serial not airing will have left in your life. So hopefully, take this as your fix. There you go. It's it's uh, it's not exactly an episode of the show, but it's about the show. So There you go. And uh, and in addition, you know, it was great to have Rabia or it's great to have Rabia on, on the show because we're hoping to unpack a lot of other things as well beyond just her, her experiences with Serial. Well, well, this is the thing. I mean, I I've known Rabia for for a little while now a bit before this all broke and you know, it's 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 I'm consistently impressed by just the sheer breadth of, of work that she does and and for those of you who don't know Rabia is a wife a mother an attorney she's president of the Safe Nation Collaborative the Na- she's a national security fellow at the New America Foundation she's a fellow of the Truman National Security Project all of which means she's much smarter than either of us uh, she writes she speaks frequently on faith national security countering violent extremism peace building women's issues and family all of which means she's more motivated than either of us. <laughs> uh, so we were, we were very excited to, to have her on. And so we, we did talk. We did, uh, we did talk plenty uh, about Serial. Don't worry, she didn't give away anything big. But she did give us uh, some more insight. She, she went deep. Uh, into a lot of the stuff that we've heard so far on the show. But she also talked about a lot of the other stuff that she does. So, so let's go ahead and play our conversation with Rabia Chodri. Uh, so, Rabia, thank you so much for, for coming on with us. We, we feel like um, uh, we're, we're catching at the wave of, of a lot of uh, uh, notice right now, obviously, because of the Serial podcast. And, and like so many people, I, I feel very privileged to say I know Rabia Chodri. I've, I've known Rabia for a while now. Thanks so much for having me, Zaki. And, yeah, no, I, I, it's, a, it's great to talk to you guys and, um, you know, that, you know, I give priority to to my buddies, so definitely. <laughs> well, we are we are totally honored. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, as Zucky sort of mentioned, I mean, obviously, uh, I don't think the Serial Podcast needs much of an introduction. Uh, it has, like, I mean, we were just talking about it earlier off air, but just you know, I think I just saw something yesterday iTunes downloads alone have now exceeded 5 million. I think I think it's now uh, the most popular podcast in history. I think I think it's now more popular than than Thriller, the Thriller album was in terms of <laughs> just the amount of people. I think it's reaching back in time is how popular it's become. Yeah, yeah um, that's kind of interesting and also I think that was those are just the statistics from iTunes and not necessarily other right. platforms. Yeah. So, okay, so now your, your involvement in sort of getting this thing out there is it's it's pretty well documented and, and we will sort of delve into that a little bit but you know it this has to come as a little bit of of a surprise to you just in terms of the sheer amount of sort of fervor uh and and passion this this show has generated i mean what do you attribute that to Oh, I mean, that's I give 100 percent of that credit to Sarah and her talent and her team's talent in telling a story. I mean, there have been so many times when I've been like in a kind of a private situation or with a friend and I'm trying to explain the story. It's got so many layers and it's really hard to it's really hard to. To, to tell to, to tell the story in a way that that show showcases like the ambiguities in it, the fuzziness in it, the weird characters in it, the gaps in it. Um, and the way they've approached it is, I think, really masterful and very 
very carefully crafted. So, you know, the story itself is interesting, but you could easily tell the story and have nobody interested in it right. because, you know, it's you. The, it's really the way she's telling the story, I think, that has captured people's imaginations. Um, and then the case itself obviously is kind of juicy, right? I mean, it's these young lovers and, you know, from these immigrant backgrounds, forbidden love and murder. And um, so... Yeah, I think uh, I don't think Sarah or anybody was prepared for this kind of response. I will be honest. I thought they were going to record at the end of her investigation, like a one hour, you know, regular This American Life show. Right. I didn't even know it was going to be in a series. Um, And I think that also is attracting a lot of people because people like the suspense. They like the that it has an ongoing nature and. Um, so no, nobody could have predicted this. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, you know, and you kind of alluded to it, but I think another reason where it sort of has struck the imagination of so many people, uh, is, is just the way that the story is told, you know, in in the age of instant downloadable media and and streaming, what have you, where people can download entire seasons of shows and, and binge watch them, you know, they're having to wait patiently. You know, literally, it's one of those, like, impatiently, impatiently, sorry. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So it's a weekly, you know, it it, it unfolds weekly and people have to wait. They have to wait. And they also are kind of involved because they feel like they're along for the ride for the whodunit, right? Like they can, Mm. you know, Sarah, Sarah has said many times that, you know, the ending is not for sure, which leaves possibilities open for people to be participatory in the in the story. Now, now going back, we all know kind of how how this started, which is which is you reaching out to her and and getting her interested. My question is, did the case spawn the format of the show, or 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 you know vice versa? Was it like they were looking to do something and this kind of fit the bill of what they wanted to do? Yeah. So I mean, she she started looking at this case uh, a little over a year ago. I think it was last October, November when I reached out. I can't remember exactly. Um, but what I understand is that she has already started like kind of researching the case when the idea for the serialized podcast was raised. You know, at um, at This American Life, and at that point she said, "Well, I have this great story I'm looking at. You know, this could be." So I don't, it, you know, I don't think this the format arose out of the story. Mm-hmm. That was something that they were considering doing, and then she said, "I have something if you guys are interested." Wow, that, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so, so it just in terms of the the, the background again, again, I, I'm, I'm assuming people who are listening to the show have at least some awareness uh, of the program, but. Uh, in in broad terms, I'd I'd love to get uh, the sort of the origins of your involvement in this, not only in terms of how your experience with Adnan, um, but also uh, what, you know what your, your your compelling interest throughout over the past you know fifteen years, fourteen years, and of uh, uh, continuing uh, to push for his. So Adnan, um, I've known Adnan since he was, I guess, a freshman in high school. That's when he became friends with my younger brother. And they've kind of been best friends since that time. Um, and I, you know, I would see him come hang out at my parents' house. And I knew his parents. His parents live, like, down, like, in the same um, subdivision as my parents. There's a lot of Pakistanis and Muslims, actually, who live in that neighborhood because it's very close to the masjid. And um, so, you know, we all we're all kind of this part of the same community. And I actually remember when Heyman was um, uh, was missing and like for weeks, every week, like we would see on TV, you know, she's still missing. She's still missing. And when he was arrested, I was like sitting in my parents house and it came his face came on the television. Uh And it's like me and my mother just like, we're like, what the hell is going on? So. You know, we so we kind of were involved, and I was in law school at the time, and I was living out of I was living in Virginia, which wasn't far, but I was basically in town every weekend, and so I was following the case at a distance because I knew he had a legal team, but I was there to support his family. I was still talking to Adnan from prison. He didn't get bail, so he would call from the jail. We would go see him, um, and then after, and then I started. I sat in the trial, the second trial. Um, the first trial ended in a mistrial within a few days. The second trial was six weeks long. I sat through most of that. And then when he was convicted, 
is when I was like, something is really wrong here. Like something went really wrong. And I got the court files. I got the attorney files. We fired the lawyer who was involved. And so since that time, I have kind of been not, not just like holding those documents, but like reviewing them and helping them find the appellate lawyers and kind of keeping on top of it. But, um, you know, my interest in the case is that I believe Adnan when he says he's innocent. He has said he's innocent from the very, very first day. He has always maintained his innocence. And I believe him. And I have every reason to believe him because I know how shoddy the state's case is. I know how crappy their witness was. I know that their witness in the first trial was a joke. And by the second trial, he was cleaned up. He was dressed nicely. It was a different person. He was a different person in court in the second trial. You're referring to the now, I guess, famous or infamous Jay? Yeah, uh-huh. I'm I'm referring to Jay. He's the only witness in there. I mean, he he's the only person who ties Adnan to the the murder. Right. So you know, I that's why I've maintained my ties to the case because I feel very deeply that it was um, a huge miscarriage of justice, mm-hmm. and that Adnan is innocent. And all these years, you know, the idea of getting media involved has come up over and over because I've brought it up many times. But we um, strategically said, let's just try to do the best we can with the appellate process. Mm-hmm. When that looked like we were close to the end, which is about a year ago, I said, forget it. I'm just going to reach out to media. And I didn't even ask him or his family. I just did it. So um, that's kind of what happened. So, I mean, this isn't this has not been discussed on the on, on the serial podcast. But um, so where are we sort of, you know, with regards to, you know, like a review of civil procedure, if you will, like so at, at post conviction. Uh, there's been one set of appeal, uh, like uh, an, a, like appeals or two. No, there's been a number. There's been, there's been a number of appeals. So what happens is after the, after a trial, um, you know, ends basically wraps up and a person's convicted. You, there are a number of technical appeals that uh, lawyers can file that are basically you're challenging the trial proceedings. Then you're challenging not the evidence presented or the facts, but you're challenging the law. So for example. At trial, when uh, um, and this is why you're going to hear Christina Gutierrez when you hear her in recorded um, in the trial, she is constantly objecting. Objection, Your Honor. Objection. Every time she objects, it forces the judge to make a legal ruling, right. and that's how an attorney preserves preserves um, the the record for for appeal. Every single objection you can raise on appeal, but those are technical. You cannot introduce new evidence. You can't say, oh, by the way, we just found, you know, these letters that nobody looked at. So you, those have to wait till something called the post conviction appeal. And th- so we went through, I think, two or three appeals, technical appeals um, that he lost and are very hard to win anyways. Um, and then we got to post conviction. We brought up the Asia letters. Asia refused to show up. Mm-hmm. That was mean that. And now there's there's other kinds of appeals that can be filed in Maryland, like collateral appeals and this. And that. But, you know, the further out you get, the harder it gets. Right. So where we are right now is that we have kind of two sets of legal teams working on the case. We have his post conviction lawyer, who is um, a great, great lawyer. And he has always believed that in a non innocence, um, like most of us, I think all of the non lawyers. And he um, is after the post conviction was denied, he filed an um, an application to file another appeal, and that's pending. Okay, then the Innocence Project got involved, which was you know the biggest, most amazing news of this entire thing in the last year for me, um, and I've known about this for a number of months now, and so they are doing their co- they're kind of doing collateral work. They they have identified evidence they want to get tested. Um, but they're representing a nun in in you know in their own proceed in their own stuff you know. And and you you've you've mentioned before you you said that the uh, the, the the prosecution's case you felt was weak. You've also mentioned that your 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 belief that his his attorney did not do a necessarily an adequate job. I was wondering if you could expand on that a mm-hmm. little bit. What what were sort of the red flags that that uh, that you perceived that that uh, you know apparently a lot of people other, other people did not. Also, if I could just sort of piggyback on that, I mean, so. We know that the attorney gets disbarred. Um, I mean, of course, she passes away later, but she gets disbarred. But that disbarment was not related at all to Adnan's case, correct? Um, that disbarment might – I mean, so Adnan also filed a complaint against okay. her. He basically kind of like broke a record in Maryland for the number of complaints against an attorney. Wow. And 
it, so, you know, collective, and he, his was one of those complaints. Collectively, I think the bar looked at that and she, she was, you know, she could have either challenged all of these complaints or just said, okay, fine, you, you know, I agree to being disbarred. And I think that's what happened, but I, I don't know exactly for sure. Um, for me, the red flags, now see, I was in law school at the time, so I couldn't be like, everybody get out of the way, I'll take care of the case. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I didn't, you know, I didn't know, uh, obviously, anything about criminal law, and uh, I couldn't represent him. And I shouldn't. Obviously, you want somebody who's experienced. But for me, what some of the red flags were the fact that she never would talk to us about the case. His parents were terrified of Christina. She was really, really um, intimidating and really just mean-spirited. And a number, a couple of times his mom was like, and his mom, his parents are really meek. They're very meek people. So they were like, Rabia, will you go with us to talk to, because I was like the only person in the whole community. Nobody went to law school back then in 99, right? Yes. I was, I was, from, yeah, I was from that generation. Like that, no, I was like one of the only people going to law school. <laughs> they were like, can you go with us? Um, you know, so, and a couple of times I went and Christina was like, who are you? I'm not answering any of your questions. And the only thing she would ever talk about was money. Mm -hmm. So every single time like we met and I, I met her twice, but then um, like in her office and then once after the conviction, she came to I mean, it was the same thing. It's all she ever wanted. She's like, I need 5000 for this. I need 10000 this. I need this. It was. And then she's like, that's it. You have no right to ask me any questions. You're not my client. Um, she also was just really um, in the courtroom. You could tell the jury couldn't stand her. Wow. She was yeah. very off-putting. She was very aggressive in a really ugly way. She wasn't assertive in a good way. Right. And she, and she didn't prepare defense. The defense lasted two days, okay, after a six-week prosecution. Wow. Um, and she, we asked her, uh, we said, listen, we have a whole community full of people who are willing to be, like, character witnesses for Adnan. She's like, no, I don't want anybody. I'm not interested. It's my case. Just get out of it. So she didn't prepare a defense for him. So I knew, I mean, and as soon as he was convicted, I was like, auntie, you have to fire her. And what happened actually, um, and this is something that um, we, I, I don't know if I told Sarah about this and I don't know if they're going to bring it up, but I'm going to blog about it soon. If, if she doesn't bring it up, we left the courthouse, the courtroom, he was convicted, right? The convictions happened. He's just been let out like in like shackles, right? Mm -hmm. We, you know, we're crying, we're heaving, we're weeping. Me and his mom and his little brother walk out of the courtroom, and Christina is there. Well, we were there, and then Christina came over, and she said the only thing she said to us was, "I need, I need fifty thousand dollars for the appeal." And that was it. She didn't say, "I'm so sorry. I will take care of this. We're gonna get him out. My condolences that I just got your kid locked up for life." Um, you know. She, that's the only thing she said. And we were in an elevator, and the elevator opened. She left, and I said, Auntie, you have to fire her. Mm -hmm. Wow. That yeah. was it. I mean, you know, and a lot of people don't realize, I mean, you know, like these criminal defense attorneys, um, you know, they, they make a lot of money on appeals. They do, yeah. Yeah, she, I mean. I just felt like she, I felt her whole strategy in the case was to not necessarily win, but to make sure she had a really great appeal record, and then just damage it there. I don't know. I don't know what her strategy was, but she had no defense. So, so I think, I mean, uh, we're, we're recording right now and the last, uh, a serial episode that has, that has aired, uh, was the one, you know, uh, what's the deal with Jay, where they actually played a lot of recordings from the trial. And I think they even talk about this sort of abrasive, you know, just her sort of abrasive courtroom, uh, demeanor, you know, well, they, as contrasted with his, yeah. Uh, with, with Jay's, you with, mean, yeah, with, with, with yeah. Jay's very calm, you know, sort of very, very polished responses. Right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, can you imagine that was her, that wasn't like a bad clip of her. That was just her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was just her. So, you know, and she even, there were time. you know, there was a, a time, a point where she called the prosecutor an asshole. They, I mean, like she just was like really not a, not, she didn't represent a non well. And yeah. Mm. And, you know, I understand. I don't I didn't know it then. I know now that she was really, really sick at the time. So I don't know if that was part of the issue. But the point is that um, Adnan and her clients shouldn't suffer because she was sick. She yeah. shouldn't have been taking work. You know, right. she shouldn't. Have been taking work. Right. Exactly. Well, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not an attorney, but I've watched years and years of Law and Order episodes. So even after, that's right. I feel like I'm an honorary attorney having seen 
the, the hours of law and order that I have. But even I know that's not, there's no way to do it. But um, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, where, where things are at right now, I mean, obviously, uh, I know you can't, you know, sort of spoil where the show is headed. But I, the, what, what I'm interested in is um, how, how is Adnan perceiving everything that's been going on? Because I would assume he's sort of in a vacuum a little bit. And does, I mean, does he have an awareness of the... He's, yeah, I just talked to him last night. Um, he he has a bit of an awareness, but there's no way he can understand, like, the, the real impact. I mean, like, he can't understand the popularity because, look... There was no such thing as social media in 1999. There was no Twitter. There wasn't. There weren't no any. You know, they, these things did not exist. So for me to explain to him the, you know, how it's trending or what's happening or how many downloads, you know, he, there were no podcasts back then. Like it just didn't happen. So you know, but but he's getting a lot of letters hmm. and um, he gets like five or six letters a day, which is a lot of a lot of mail. Wow. And, getting it from all over the world and he's um he's getting a lot of pictures from a lot of ladies and uh, he's returning some of those pictures <laughs> so, some some highly inappropriate pictures you know he's kind of a religious guy so he's a little bit like uh, like oh my god what is happening it's it's um, really i mean the the way in which it's this has turned into really i mean a phenomenon is the only way yeah. I, can, I can i mean i feel like all we need is like a bob dylan song at this point <laughs> you know yeah. but but it's it's it really it, he doesn't get that he's not going to understand that yeah I, I you know until you mentioned it I, I didn't even think about that like just the fact that I mean well, just talk about a man trending. out of time yeah just trending, the word trending right, exactly you know? right would be like what? Yeah, how do I say you know there's hashtags that are tra- he, that it's meaningless he doesn't even know how he's he's True. I don't know how he would understand what that means you know, he, I mean, it's not that he look he can watch um there's certain news channels are allowed to watch and then they okay. he'll come in. He'll come in contact with inmates who are, um, you know, relatively new, so they might understand. But unless you're in it and yeah. you see it and you're in the reddits and the subreddits and there's no way to, for him to understand. I told him last night that, you know, it's the most it, – uh, that the Serial broke the record for um, downloads, and he's like, uh-huh. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't know, right? I mean, I'm um, in it and I don't understand it, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Like in terms of technology and social media, so. Um, but the other thing is this, you know, we when he calls, it's not like you have all the time in the world to yeah. talk. Like we have to talk about some like like actual pro- issues. Yeah. Like you know, there's like a legal uh, his legal team from Innocence Project went to try to go see him a couple weeks ago and they they weren't allowed in. So it was like, okay, how do we deal with this issue? Because they have to be on a visiting list. There's all the so you know there's other things we in that little bit of time he has that we have to try to get through, which are much more important. Right. Is it? I mean, what's I would imagine that after this many years and after having gone through however many, you know, sort of disappointments, um, he's sort of steeled himself to, you know, the idea that that this could lead to a change. I mean, is it what is his mindset even even after you sort of explain everything that's going on? You know, I mean, first of all, it's like we have to understand when you talk to somebody who has been institutionalized for half their life. Mm. You know, from seven, 17 to 33, right? To me, <laughs> my mind's eye, he's still 17 in some ways, right? He, um, for his, so for him, it's like um, he was the most hopeful for the post conviction, and up until the post conviction appeal, he was because um, you know we thought the Asia letters, it's a slam dunk. The lawyer never, the fact that the lawyer never even contacted a potential alibi witness that's a slam dunk in terms of ineffective assistance of counsel and that he lost on both, you know, so he was um, the first time I ever heard him very disappointed and kind of sad was after the post conviction. And in 15 years, I've never heard him sound like that because he is kind of naturally a very, um, very positive person who is really like kind of, you know, he's always like, Alhamdulillah, right? Like, I mean, like, the, he'll he'll call me, he'll talk to me like, oh my gosh, what's happening in Iraq, you know? Alhamdulillah, we're really blessed that we're, like, safe and we're not in war zones. And, like, mm-hmm. he's just one of those people who is kind of can, in this zen space sometimes. Um, so, but he, even now, he's like, you know, he's really thankful and um, positive about the possibilities that are coming out of the podcast, but... He has said to me once that, listen, you know, there's other cases that got a lot of media and then nothing happened. He's like, so I think he's trying to temper like me and like his mom, like all our excitement. I think he's like, you know, just he's like, you know, just uh, 
keep making dua, basically. That's his always what he says is keep making wow. dua. Well, and, and that is something that I think about, you know, by virtue of the fact that this is kind of burning white hot, white hot right now. I mean, uh, recent history tells us that the hotter something burns, the kind of faster it burns out. Mm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I, I imagine that when the, it's over, by, you know, the middle of January, people are, are going to be doing other things, you know. I don't know. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah I, I guess if the, yeah, if it runs 12 to 14 episodes, yeah, we're looking at right around the end of the year, correct? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Okay, right. So, you know, I mean, just we, we, we've talked about the sort of just the phenomenon that it's become. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on it because, I mean, I don't want to sort of sensationalize the fact that at the end of the day, we, we are dealing with someone's life here. Um, you know, but but one of the things that has fascinated me uh, as a as a you know, not only someone who's listens to the show, but someone who is involved with like various like 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 just various discourses within the Muslim community is uh, is the fact that, you know, he, here is here is a story that is obviously uh, has sort of, you know, is, is getting a lot of national attention. And it's about a, 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 a young Muslim man who, uh, you know, was was involved in things that, you know, at we as a community collectively don't like to talk about, right? The fact that we have young people who are, you know, dating and who are probably doing drugs and things like that. So I think, on, on, you know, there is, you know, to me, that part of that conversation or, or uh, have you, uh, you know, do you think that there's a, there's a conversation happening within, you know, within the Muslim community or within certain Muslim communities about these issues now that the story has sort of become such a, you know, such a part of the national uh, discourse? You know what's interesting? I mean, like you know, for for at least our community and his family and everybody close, that yeah. ship that ship sailed like 15 years ago, right? It's like yeah. everything everything was in the public, right? I mean, his mother was sitting in the courtroom when they're talking about like you know, um, him and Hay and 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 their you know their um their relationship and the fact that they're having sex and the fact that he was doing po- I mean, all of that was there and the, and many members of the community were sitting in the same courtroom so that but you know what what happened then was like people would leave the courtroom and then never mention it like that was it that was the end of it because that's been our that's how we work right like we've always been about con- containment keep it quiet keep it contained right um and i think um now it's different. I feel like most people as they're listening to this, especially like people in my generation and younger, are kind of not flinching because they're like, yeah, well, that's everybody's experience, you know. Well, not every. I mean, obviously, not all of us are doing everything, but the point is that nobody is surprised at hearing this because it's kind of like how a lot of people from different cultures end up operating. You know, they hide a lot of things from their parents and. Western teenagers also hide a lot of things from their parents, right? I mean, yeah. so it is not exactly like, oh my god. But uh, what what I um what I find interesting is that I haven't seen a lot of conversation about like, okay, now we need to come out in, in the open and talk about um dating and drugs in our community because I feel like we're like past it. I feel like people know it's there. Yeah. And I don't think it's so taboo anymore. Um. But and I also think, you know, for example, look, when when I was young, when I was really young, right, the idea still back then was that your marriage is going to happen because um, your parents will introduce you to somebody like that's how it was when, you know, when I was like in my um, teens and early 20s. Now we're at a point and I have a teenager where we most most young people, the parents expect you to go find somebody and let us know. Right. Like just keep it halal, but find somebody on your own. Um. So I think the, even the expectations of young people have changed over time. Um, so true. So it's not, yeah, it's not so hard. But I have heard, I did hear, now this didn't happen in my family, but I did hear that a lot of young people who were his friends at the time, that the parents then told them, you stay away from him, stay away from this case, and this is what happens when you, when you, you, know, when you sin. <laughs> These are the kinds of things that happen when you commit sins. Yeah. So yeah, some, no, I mean, yeah. when I was saying like just yeah, conversations taking place within the Muslim community. Yeah, I mean, I was certainly talking about that part of it. You know, just the, you know, like uh, I guess people who aren't part of our generations that are responding to it as well. And I could definitely see that as being the response. See, this is what happens when you go astray. You know. Yeah, I mean, that was part of the re- that was part of the response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that- then the, the I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. 
No, no, I was saying that was part of the response back. And what's interesting is like my mom and my dad are both really religious people, mm -hmm. um, and they didn't they didn't respond like that at all. In fact, they're the reason they're you know they were all like, no, we have to stand by Adnan and stay with this, and and that's why my brother my brother testified for him at the grand jury. He testified he mm -hmm. and my brother is one of the maybe the only people and only guys in the community who said, yeah, so what? I'm I was dating. I mean, we're like this is. You know, nothing Adnan was doing was like duplicitous or evil. This is just how we operate. Right. And you heard, you heard him in episode one, yeah. totally about himself. Uh, right. <laughs> the little TMI, TMI moment, right? <laughs> TMI moment, yeah. Speaking of which, um, I'm trying to find a nice girl for him, but at this point, it's going to be even harder. <laughs> well, listeners, there you go. Yeah, I know we've never tried the podcast as a matrimonial service. This Maybe we're missing out. Podcast <laughs> slash Rishta. <laughs> Uh, vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but I mean, I think I think there's a lot of layers uh, to what you're saying, right? Because because I, I mean, I have to be honest that as as I have been listening to it, there's definitely that part of me that that has this sort of split reaction where there is that sense of like it, this is wrong, it's a miscarriage of justice, something very wrong. He did not deserve this. But then there is that little part of me that's like. You know, it's almost like you gave an opening by virtue of, you know, everything that you were doing to to keep this secret became a way for the prosecution to say, look at how he's keeping his life secret. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's it's weird because as as a Muslim myself and, and I'm the same age as Adnan, I think I'm just slightly older than him. Mm -hmm. a, a lot. I mean, a, a lot of this, my reaction has been sort of like there, but for the grace of God, go I. Sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this could be, I mean, like if you, you know, the, the interesting thing is like it's, Islamically, we're told that even if you commit a sin, like hide it from others. Like right. that, that is the Islamic ethos, that even if you sin, you hide it, keep yeah. it between you and Allah and mm -hmm. don't make others witness to it. Right. There's right. that. There's the idea. Like and then his family is so like kind of conservative. You know, his father has been part of the Jamaat his whole life. Mm -hmm. They don't. He didn't even have a TV in his house. Like they grew up without a TV. They're that kind of that religious, mm -hmm. and so for them, for him, this was part of um, not just that that idea, but also the idea of like not um, not putting it in his parents' face. You know, not disrespecting them. Where I'm just listen. I'm gonna do whatever I want to do, and mm -hmm. you know. But it's not like his his mother was on him. I mean, Nandi was like, I totally knew he was talking to girls, and I was like on his butt, you know, about it. Um, Wow. But this is a story that happens everywhere. I mean, like, you know, I was, when I went to college, I met my first husband, who is now my ex-husband. And, you know, we started going out. And, you know, I mean, and my parents kind of knew, but they are also like, you're not allowed to see him, but okay, you can marry him at some point. Um, this is just, you know, so, but there wasn't anything that was so nefarious that would, if, if that was the case, then we should all be in jail, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. so true. You know, for, for unless... Every, unless you've lived a life that's totally in the open and everybody knows everything about you. I don't know. I mean, well, if, if nothing else, what, what it really highlights for me at least is, uh, you know, the, the, the necessity of, of having a dialogue with your kids right. about these sort of issues that have remained, you know, kind of, uh, you know, as demonstrated by this case, sort of out of sight, out of mind. I mean, I think, you know, it's it's weird because my, my experience as I consumed this this what whatever uh, is being said in the case is both as a parent and as a child and having I'm mm -hmm. I'm kind of at the nexus in between as I think a lot of people are so there's that's uh, and I think we as as Muslims have again we have a, a it's like a, an added level of involvement by virtue of this, which is, which is, I would assume a conversation that the, the quote unquote mainstream audience is not having, you know? Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and I think, you know, there, you know, I brought it up a number of times about how the community and see, I, when I met Adnan and my brother met Adnan, you know, he was a freshman and my brother was a freshman in high school. So it's not like we knew him since he was a real little kid. Mm -hmm. um, but people who knew him as a real little kid kind of like just walked away. And I think that was connected to the fact that they were like judging him for these things Same. and they wanted to yeah, create a distance. But, um, you know, we as a uh, kind of looking at these issues, how we the funny thing is, like, you know, I have, as a teenage, <laughs> I have a teenage daughter and I still I still don't know if I if I can sit down and have these conversations with her. Like I just feel like you know, 
she knows what's right and she knows what's wrong. And and if she does something wrong, I don't want to know about it. Like I'm still in that place. It's re- still very uncomfortable. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, but what's I, I, I'm sorry, you were saying? No, I was just gonna say that you know one thing I thought going into this was that I thought for the mainstream public that mo- a lot of people are gonna be really honing on in on the Muslimy aspects, and people really aren't. Exactly, and 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 you know that was actually I, mean, I was kind of saving that as my next question. Oh, sorry. But, <laughs> no, 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 because I, I think there, there's a mirror image to the the, the the question and the discussion we've had so far around the Muslim community's response or conversations that that may or may not be taking place, but I'm fascinated by the fact that they are or are not, is the, is the fact that here, again, if, you know, quote unquote, the mainstream audience is, you know, attached to this story about a young Muslim man who is convicted of this crime. And like you said, the Muslim aspect has not been sort of part of the conversation. Uh, and what I mean about, or, or what I mean by that is the fact that uh, oh, look, you know, you mean to say that young Muslim men in the in the in, in the in, in these mosques and Muslim communities aren't ISIS in training that they're out there smoking weed and, and dating like, you know, wow. Like, you know what I mean? And so there's that whole part of it. Um, that's the that's the pitch. We're like, no, we smoke weed. <laughs> you have to love us now. Yeah. I mean, the, and, and I also thought I really thought because, you know, sometimes you uh, when you're. I mean, his family is really private, but for me, and I told Sarah this, I'm going to, I was told her I'm going to shamelessly piggyback on your show because this might be the only chance we have to tell a non story. And I have to be an advocate for him in this time Yeah. because you know, once it's over, maybe people are not going to care. So this is the time I'm going to give the interviews. I'm going to blog. And I expected also some conversation around the fact that I'm obviously a visibly Muslim woman yeah. and, a, and, and somebody who is, you know, a, must be devout because I wear a hijab and those conversations haven't really happened. And what, in all my interviews, nobody really brings it up. And I think that's great. Actually, I'm glad to finally talk about not being Muslim in a way and, and this not being a Muslim thing, this just being like an, um, an, an act of, um, you know, a, a, a miscarriage of justice that despite the fact that it was a Muslim community or a Muslim kid. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Well, and and I, I think that actually provides kind of a good segue into some of some of the the broader conversation which we wanted to have, which is your role as as sort of a, a an outspoken advocate for for Muslim related issues. You've you've uh, you, you've been a very vocal critic of, of Bill Maher, for example, and his sort of. Uh, uh, his his special dislike uh, for Islam and, and Muslims and and I think um, in in a sense uh, certainly in, in the last few years uh, over the time I've known you um, a lot of people listen to what you have to say oh yeah yeah a lot of people uh, hate me too <laughs> there's that um, well, 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 well it was funny because when I heard the ep- like again I I didn't know like I started listening to the show. Uh, not knowing that you were connected with it, and then when when your name came across on the first episode, I said, "Oh, is is, is that the same Rabia Choudhury? You know, who, whose pieces I've been reading, you know, for the last few months or whatever, you know." So, yeah, it was, it was like, "Oh, yeah, one and the same." <laughs> yeah, it's kind of surreal. I feel like this whole year has been like one controversy after another. Um, from well, like Alice, go back to the Mipsters, or yeah, well, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, actually, starting last year. So it was like Mipsters, Alice in Arabia. Yeah, Abu Isa. Abu Isa. Yeah, I can't um, that th- this is all stuff you're, you're going to have to unpack for us because I think a oh, lot. Sorry. <laughs> I think a lot. A lot of our listeners are just like I don't know any of that. Oh, okay, okay. So these are just. I mean, it's just you know I, I don't want to go through every single one, but like <laughs> different issues forget, have. Let's not forget Israeli like 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 Jew lover, Zionist lover. Yeah. I was getting there. I was going in chronological order of tragedy and sorry. you know. You got to learn. I, I, that's right. She, she's learned from Sarah Koenig how to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm building the narrative. I'm building the narrative. Yeah. So, you know, I have been literally in the last month um, been told by two people who know me that I am a polarizing figure. And I have never I feel like I'm a mom. Right. Like I just go home and I make do laundry and cook curry. I can't. I, it's weird for me to be like categorized like that. But, you know, I've written for many, many years. It's just that I've concentrated a little more on and and I'll get requ- like in the last couple of years. I get requests. Mm-hmm. So. Like, you know, if something happens like the like, so the Alice in Arabia thing, when that happened, I got a request from Time magazine. Can you write about this? Mm. You know, or um, if something else happens, I'll get a request from somebody. Can you write about this issue? And sometimes I'll, I'll do that. And so 
a lot of times they'll trend to be issues that are hot button issues from for Muslims like like Mipsters, which should not be a hot button issue, but it became one. And and and, and what was that for for people who who might not be familiar? Yeah. Um, Mipsters was basically a, there was a video that was made about, I guess about a year ago, um, that was just, it showed young women who come from a self-identified community known as um, the Mipsters, Muslim hipsters. And these, basically these are women who are doing, young women who are doing all kinds of things. You know, one's like skateboarding, one is like, I don't know, it's just in their everyday lives. But, you know, they're dressed in very hip, you know, stylish, um, fashionable clothing, but they're all like wearing hijab with it. And, you know, they're wearing heels. And so they look cool, trendy, but hijabi. And the issue was that, I mean, there were so many critiques, so many critiques. There were like a socioeconomic critique of the video. There was the the classical conservative, this is not hijab sister critique. There was, um, there was the, we don't like, this is objectifying women. And, you know, all of those women who participated in the video did it out of their own agency. And, and I felt like, so I just wrote a piece saying, I'm so sorry that you are getting all this flack because um, I'm tired of women being like the lightning rod for being dressed this way or being dressed that way. That way. I mean, just can you just freaking let us dress the way we want to dress already, people? Um, and so that was what Mipsters was about. Then, uh, then there was some Abu Isa. I, we can forget about Abu Isa. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> people gonna look, just look him up. Just look him up. And then, you know, I went. Um, I, I was a fellow in a program for about uh, that started about a year and a half ago um, in the first cohort with a with an Israeli institute called Shalom Hartman Institute that also has a very very influential presence in North America like most of North American Jews um, it's like Al Maghrib like people just know it right it's like they just know uh, what Shalom Hartman is and they're an educational institute so they teach Judaism and they teach rabbis and they teach students or whatever. So um, there's somebody I know very personally, Imam Abdullah Tepli, who's a dear friend and mentor of mine for more than a decade, um, and he developed the program. And so then he came to people that he knew. He said, I've developed this program. I would like to be part of the first cohort. Just trust me. Trust my strategic vision and just do it. And, and, th- and that's what I did because I really, he is a mentor to me and I trust him. And the program had other names that of people that I highly respect and I think who are great critical thinkers. Um, and you know, my whole life has been, I've never come any way, but one way down on the Palestinian Israeli issue, like most Muslims, right? We're always like, you know, we're, we're always in the Palestinian camp and like a decade ago, I was the person who was like protesting in front of the Holocaust museum. So I've always been there. So, um, for me, it was really an educational and intellectual exercise to try to learn, like, from their perspective. I wanted to learn about Judaism, but I also wanted to learn, like, why they believe that land is so central to their faith. Like, that was really, I just wanted to know what it is they're really, so when, after we did the whole program, and it was an amazing program. And, and it was for how long? It was a year long. I spent, we spent two weeks in Jerusalem, then we studied, um, like, basically um, uh, online for a year, and then we met again for two weeks in Jerusalem. And we came back this past summer, you know, I wrote this piece in time, um, they totally, they kind of screwed me over because they changed the title, and I think it was a very inflammatory title. And, and that title was? So the title I proposed was Finding Common Ground in the Holy Land, and they changed it to Fresh. what in America, Seems yes, normal. I, uh, not just normal, but very nice and happy, right? And they changed it to what an American Muslim learned from Zionist. And <laughs> I was like, thank you so much for, like, totally destroying my career. But, um, you know, so it brought in a tremendous backlash, and especially because it happened, it came out like a week before the Gaza assault this summer. It was past so, summer. Yeah, so it was just a really sensitive time. It was... Um, in a way, it was poor timing. In a way, it was trial by fire. I still stand by the program. A second cohort is ready to go. Um, and I think that there is room in this program to create an engagement between American Muslims and American Jews that has never happened before. And that's what we're looking for. We're not going to be solving a, a conflict in the Middle East. Um, I'm not Palestinian anyway. So, I mean, like, my relevance to it is, like, from a real distance, right, just as a Muslim but our focus was so anyhow that was like a big controversy and it, then it went away. I mean, how, how do you respond to, the, to to that criticism? Just just picking up on what you were saying because I know uh, there, there were many people uh, who 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 are Palestinian who that was their number one complaint. Who who are you to speak for us? 
But we didn't speak for them. We didn't speak for anybody. We just went to learn. It's like me going to a university and taking a class. We literally took the almost identically, well, not identically, but most of the curriculum was their rabbinical curriculum. So we would study Torah together. Like we were there as students to learn. And then because of our own sensitivities, Imam Abdullah worked in um, time to meet with Palestinians, to go to the West Bank, um, to meet with activists across the spectrum. We also, we wanted to see the ugly too. So we were like, yeah, let's meet the settlers. Let's go to a settlement. Like we wanted to kind of confront all that and see it with, see that in, and then be able to bring it back to the people who are educating us and say, that sounds all nice and great on paper, but this is what it looks like now. And how do you challenge that? So we didn't go to speak for anybody necessarily. Um, it was supposed to just be a learning exercise. Obviously, and when you spend two weeks together with a group and then these you know, faculty members, it turns into dialogue after time. It's, you cannot escape the political realities around these questions. And we were always bothered and we would always bring it up. And um, so it, it forced them to think in ways they hadn't, and it forced us to think in ways. So, but this was not an Israeli-Palestinian Middle East peace conflict type of program at all. It wasn't. And I mean, what's what would you say is a part of your experience that that you had while there, um, or even you know for for the year that you you were, you were involved? Uh, what do you feel is part of it that ha- is is has sort of been lost in in the dialogue that you feel is a really important thing that people aren't talking about? Um, the part of the dialogue that I mean, I feel like for me, look, I've done. Anybody who participates in the program is going to come away with different things, and they went they went into it for different reasons, right? Mm-hmm. Now, me, I've been I've done interfaith work, like really grassroots work, for many many years, and what has always um, been hard for me to understand, um, and this is just my personal utility. I don't know, you know, I can't speak for others. Um, was that you know there were that I would be working with with Jews who were very accommodating, very friendly, very wanting to embrace Muslims and Islam. But as soon as there was like a conflict in the Middle East, they went into, a, you know, everybody separated into their camps. Yeah, sure. So right. For me, and you know, as a Muslim, I was like, how do you not, and I forget as a Muslim, just as a human being, it was like, how do you not see like the oppression and the place of Israel in that oppression? Like, how can you do that over? So now I'm, I feel like I'm in a position where, I can actually address, like, if that happened again, I mean, has happened, that I can have a convert instead of us retreating to our corners, Mm. I can actually have a conversation. Um, I have the language and the tools and the understanding that I really didn't have uh, before. And I also have uh, the fact that, you know, I can say, listen, I studied the Shalom Hartman Institute, and immediately, you know, I've had this reaction already so many jews are like what oh okay all of a sudden like these defenses kind of fall and you get a glimpse into their internal conversations that you never realize like there's so much internal conflict among jews and israelis about this like they're so um it's not like it's just you know the way we look at people look at muslims like we're just one big block they also are they're not one big block and they're very very conflicted and you see the conflict you see it growing with every with every um, military um, assault, Ooh. especially in American Jews. So it's like, how do we then leverage that? How do we say, listen, American Muslims can be your allies um, if, you know, and 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 just, you know, and, and stop looking at us like enemies, basically. So, oh. And it's weird because, you know, on one hand, it's like we growing up, and especially after 9-11, we were always told, look at how the American Jews did it. They just did such a great job of building influence, blah, blah, blah. But on the other hand, we've never gotten close to actually see it. Um, to see how they do it or even um, have them, you know, join us in these efforts, whether it's anti-Sharia legislation, whether it's other types of things. I mean, they are not, they should be natural allies for us and vice versa. But something happens in Israel and everybody just walks away and it shouldn't be like I mean, we're, we're recording a day after the, the, the yeah. killing at at the synagogue. And I mean, unfortunately, you know, it, that sort of, illustrates what you're what you're talking about you know what's past tends to be prologue with with uh, what's happening in that region unfortunately yeah and i mean i islamically also you know and again 
my interest in this was like I want to understand them from a religious perspective, like what the, how they feel as people of faith. But Islamically, the ethos is that you engage with people you don't agree with until and unless they become abusive to you. So if there was ever an instance like with Shalom Hartman faculty where they were abusive or obnoxious or disrespectful of me as a person or as a Muslim, that would, you know, I, I don't have to engage with that person. I don't, I won't engage. But they never were. And so it's that we are told, you know, Moses was told, go talk to Pharaoh. <laughs> right. We're told to talk, talk until you can. And, and hopefully you never get to a point of fighting if you don't have to. Yeah. Mm. Well, so, it, I, I was just going to ask, I mean, uh, uh, could you also maybe speak to like some of the work that you do uh, at the New America Foundation? Uh, right. And, and then your, your your own sort of safe nation collaborative that, that, that you're the founder of? Yeah. So my I um, I'll start with safe nation. It's something I launched about four years ago. And basically um, in 2009, 2010, all of these I, I as an attorney was representing um, a number of clients. I mean, like a whole year. Every every month I had new clients for almost a year that were basically coming to me and saying they were immigrant clients, um, either undocumented or in the immigration process, who were being asked to become informants in the Muslim community. And um, basically the idea was that this FBI or somebody would approach them from a federal agency and say, if you don't if you don't become an informant and collect for us information, then we, we could hurt you in your immigration process or get you deported. So after about a year of doing that, I um, started looking into like what's going on. And then all these stories came out about police training, about the kind of trainings the FBI is getting and the Pentagon's getting and really anti-Muslim trainings. And I realized at that point that there's no Muslim organization that's doing these trainings. Like nobody's dedicating their time. It's really ad hoc. Um, sometimes a local police chief will go to the masjid and tell an uncle, can you do some training, diversity training? And that was it. But there was no organization that was really dedicated to law enforcement training. Um, ING does educational stuff, but I'm talking about law enforcement. So, yeah. you know, we spent time. I, I did like a year worth. Of, I did a year long national security fellowship and then developed a curriculum and launched the law enforcement training. And it's been going um, ongoing for the last three or four years now. I was brought on to New America Foundation um, about a year and a half ago to help them develop and execute social media trainings. And and really, my only connection to this was the fact that I knew how to put together trainings um, for American Muslim communities. And what happened was that um, we have tech partners who are funding the training, Google and Facebook. And uh, they, the partners recognize, these guys recognize that what's happening online is that like the average, the average Muslim voice is just totally drowned out, right? The average Muslim narrative is drowned out. It's either the Pamela Gellers telling people what Islam is about, or it's the Al Baghdadis, right, telling people what Islam is about. Uh, and that mm-hmm. somewhere in the middle, for some reason, we can't get our stories right. We have really bad PR. We don't know how to use social media. Whatever it is, <laughs> you talk to. All of the above, and you know, in any community, there's there's like thousands of amazing Muslim projects happening all around, around the country, but nobody knows about them. So they said, listen, we're willing to fund trainings to help American Muslims tell their stories better. Just tell it better, you know, get better at sharing your stuff. And so I, uh, my role at New America was to help facilitate that, you know, organize the trainings, um, figure out what communities, what cities in the country would have the most impact, who really needs the resources, um, and get the right people in the room. And so, um, and you know, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about social media doing this myself. So <laughs> that's really my my role with New America Foundation. And and we just did one in Boston, and we have five other cities coming up. Um, last year we had three cities. Wow. Well, hopefully you'll visit the Bay Area soon, or or, or yeah. You know. We did, we did, yeah, we did the Bay Area last year. We did the Bay Area. Maybe oh, we'll come back in a couple of years. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, as as we sort of wrap things up here, just uh, uh, anything you can tell us about uh, what's coming up on Serial in terms of, uh, again, no, no spoilers necessarily, but um, uh, based on based on what you know, you know, we, we gotta we gotta promote this podcast, so. Yeah, it's all. So I honestly, um, the reason I couldn't tell you many spoilers is because I don't know anymore. <laughs> the only the only thing, like Sarah's pretty much covered almost m- much of what I know. Mm. Uh, but even then, for example, like, you know, I know what Jay's story was, right? I know his involvement, but I never heard that interview. I knew the Innocence Project was involved, but I never heard their interview either. So I'm, every episode that comes out, I'm learning things and I'm hearing things and I, and, and she's met witnesses and people I've never known. Um, I, I, she has not done a story on his lawyer Gutierrez. I really hope she does. 
if she doesn't, um, I don't know what the remaining four episodes could could have because everything I know kind of has been talked about to an extent, you know. Of course, you know, sometimes what she'll do, she'll talk about something and then I'll go blog and I'll kind of expand on it. But in terms of actual, like, plot lines and, you know, things, people that have not been mentioned, um, wh- whoever's out there other than Gutierrez uh, is going to be a surprise to me, too. Right. Oh, wow. You know, I, and I, I hate to bring this up near the end, but, because, but it was something that I wanted to ask earlier, and then I'd be remiss not to ask, and since you raised the issue about, you know, sort of everything that, that, that you know to date has sort of in some form or fashion been covered in the show – um, you know, I want you to talk about because again, I don't remember if I read it uh, on your blog or elsewhere, where where the, the, there was a real uh, or a or a or a part or a component of the prosecution's case at trial was to paint Adnan as this, you know, angry Muslim male, right? Who was, you know, the honor of the family was at stake, and so he does what any. Muslim would do just to, you know, he, he has air quotes right now. Folks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I, I, I say that almost, you know, and again, it, it kind of goes back to what we were saying about Adnan and, you know, and, 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 you know, look, he was convicted back in 1999. I mean, we're talking about a conviction that takes place pre nine 11. So there's that, that's certainly not part of the, of the narrative, but, Right. Yet at the same time, that was a component of the prosecution's case. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the extent of that was. You know, um, the extent of that was much more overt in the first trial. Okay. And I, think, I feel like they kind of pulled it back a little bit in the second trial. But in the first trial, they were very overt about it. It was kind of like, I mean, they 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 made clear reference to the idea that, you know, this is like a a cultural phenomena and this was honor besmirched. And um, even I remember, I have like this vague recollection of when they applied for bail for him Uh and he was denied bail. But part of the state's um, state's argument was something to the effect of, you know, that if he's granted bail, like he could be smuggled out of the country because people would be willing to help him because, it's such it's not such a big deal in their community right mm. and in the second trial i felt like they they brought it they they rolled it back a little bit but um how do you escape like a room full of you know uncles with beards and aunties and hijabs right like that was the visual right is the second trial after 9/11 or still we're still talking no. It was still pre nine eleven, but look, these stereotypes have existed. You can, we know. I mean, there, there's been oh, media man. research, you know, about about the controlling, angry Muslim misogynist man. Right. Um, so that's always that's always existed. Now it's one thing. I mean, the Adnan had like never been like he couldn't even speak the language. He's he was such an American kid. If yeah. anything, I mean, going back to what we were talking about just you know moments ago, it underscores the work that you're doing with you know the safe nation collaborative and whatnot, you know, like really training law enforcement about, you know, about Islam and Muslims when that's all they may know. Well, and, and uh, you, you are doing sort of regular commentaries uh, on on each episode via uh, your blog, which is, uh, I think, uh, let's, let's put in a plug there. What's, what's the website for your blog? So I am actually moving my blog to my own site now and starting tonight will be my first blog up on that site. It's um, splitthemoon.com. Splitthemoon.com. Okay, and uh, you're you're also doing um, a weekly uh, video podcast. Yes, um, that it's like a live Google Hangout that I do with Pete um, Roraba, who is a professor of communications and media, and we have different people. Sometimes, like one time, my brother Saad joined us last week or this past week. Um, um Adam, this uh, who's a moderator on one of the on the subreddit, um, joined us to talk about what's happening on Reddit because that's a that's a whole phenomenon of its own. I mean, I don't know if you know, but Hayes' brother like went on the Reddit the other day on the subreddit. Has, has that identity been, identity been verified? Like, I, I read it, and then there was question as to whether or not that was. It was verified. The mods verified him. He's oh. he's he's definitely Hayes' brother. Wow. And um and he posted on there. So you know that's Reddit is like an ecosystem of its own that has a lot of things going on. And, you know, he posted there, uh, this is after Sarah and other journalists were not able to get a statement from them, so. Wow. <laughs> so so definitely a lot going on. Uh, Serial is not over yet. We still have a few episodes yet, but clearly there's there's a lot to 
to digest. And if if you are listening to, if you're not listening to it, you absolutely should be. But if you are listening to it, uh, there's there's lots of places online to sort of expand your own awareness of that case. Um, yeah. Well, well, Rabia, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, well, we're back, and uh, that was uh, uh, that was that was really insightful. I'm sure I'm sure that uh, you all found it just as engaging as, as we did. And again, big big thanks to Rabia for for coming on and, and chatting with us. We know she's plenty busy, so the fact that she did make time for us is, is something we're uh, very grateful for. Yeah, um, uh, something that's oh, sorry. I, um, you know, we continue to get feedback. Uh, we continue to get some great responses and feedback from you guys who are listening. Uh, one of the more memorable ones of late, uh, and, and one that I really took to heart as, as as a as a word of compliment was, I think, a friend of yours, Zaki, who sort of described our podcast as sort of just sitting in on a conversation or feeling like they were in the room as we were talking. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of, I mean, that's that's certainly by design. Or, I, I think that, I think that was in reference to the Dean o- yeah. Obedola episode. So right. uh, they yeah. felt like they were sitting next to us as we were loudly slurping our food. So Right. So, yeah, there, I think the ambiance certainly contributed to that. But just in general, that, that was sort of what we wanted to achieve with the show was just to have a very... Uh, uh, unscripted, uh, free flowing conversation with our guest, and we hope we've achieved that. Uh, and well, that that's been the goal thus far, and certainly that's the goal going forward. We've got some we've got some big uh, guests coming up in future episodes, so definitely keep it tuned there. Now, just a reminder: if you are looking for us online, we are not hard to find. You can find us at diffusecongruence.podbean. Dot com. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. Uh, I know Pervez is on Twitter with a handle that's long and complicated. What, what is that again? The new Madhab. Uh, M-A-D-H-H-A-B. There you go. And if that's too hard to spell, you can find me at Zucky's Corner. That's Z-A-K-I-S Corner. And uh, uh, you can also find me at the Huffington Post where my film reviews go up. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not far from anyone's reach, unfortunately. I'm, I'm very annoying online. I apologize. You don't know me, but I apologize. <laughs> uh, I haven't annoyed you yet, but I will. And uh, I think uh, that wraps up another episode. Oh, you can also re- reach us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. So, Do send us your feedback. Yeah, let us know what you think. And, and write us a review on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, because uh, everything you say uh, uh, makes us feel better. Can and will be used against you. Yeah. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was still wrapped up in that whole... <laughs> there you Court, go. Courtroom drama. <laughs> but thank you again for listening. This is Diffuse Congruence. We'll see you next time. <laughs>